This is a Main Hustle Media Podcast. Hello and welcome to the show. My name is Jackie O and you're listening to Militantly Mixed. Yo, this is Rashani from the Single Simulcast. And when I'm not making you laugh or making up parody songs, I'm kicking back listening to Militantly Mixed. I would like to acknowledge that the Militantly Mixed podcast is recorded on the traditional lands of the Chumash and the Tongva people, and I wish to pay my respects to the people of those nations, both past and present. Everyone in the world has gone to bed one night or another with fear or pain or loss or disappointment, and yet each of us has awakened, arisen, uh, somehow made our ablution, seen other human beings, and said, morning, how are you? Fine, thanks, in you. It's amazing. Wherever that abides in the human being, there is the nobleness of the human spirit. Despite it all, black and white, Asian, Spanish, Native American, pretty, plain, thin, fat, vowed a celibate, we rise. You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Just cause I walk as if I have oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like suns and like moons, with the certainty of tides, just like hope springing high, still I rise. Did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries? Does my sassiness upset you? <laughs> Don't take it so hard just because I laugh. <laughs> as if I have gold mines digging in my own backyard. You can shoot me with your words. You can cut me with your lies. You can kill me with your hatefulness. But just like life, I rise. Does my sexiness offend you? Oh, does it come as a surprise that I dance? as if I have diamonds at the meeting of my thighs. Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise. Up from a past rooted in pain, I rise. A black ocean leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak miraculously clear, I rise bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. I am the hope and the dream of the slave. And so, naturally, there I go rising. Welcome to Militantly Mixed, the podcast about race and identity from the mixed race perspective. I am your host, Charmaine, a.k.a. Mixed Girl Maine. And this is episode 95. I really struggled to try to talk about what is going on in particular in the United States right now, but a version of this is happening all over the world, make no mistake. Um, and giving full focus and, and honor to the episode that I had planned today. <laughs> What's important to me about Militantly Mixed is that we are creating a footprint of mixed race narratives told by us 
for us and about us. I, I mentioned that the other day. I've, I've sprinkled that throughout um, the show, but um, generations like my own and those that precede me, we didn't have places we can go for a slew of mixed race narratives where we could see ourselves in a story somewhere. We didn't have many places, if we had any at all, to go to and refer to to see ourselves. And as growing up, many of us are in situations where we're told we're not enough of something or another or all the things that we're mixed with. And so we go through our lives as these sort of, to quote Caitlin from an earlier episode last year, uh, the the first year, blobs were these mixed blobs that that just don't have any place to plug into in parts of our lives. I mean, some of us end up finding our, our place and we're lucky for that, but a lot of us don't. So what's important to be a militantly mix is that I have created this space solely for the purpose of sharing our mixed race narratives from our own mouths, from our own minds, from our own experiences, and, and that every episode is, is given the, the, the honor that it deserves and the focus that it deserves. And I have several episodes already or interviews already recorded and planned to release over the next few weeks. And uh, I just didn't, I, I just couldn't go by and not address what is happening right now because it, what's happening right now feels very personal to me and my own experience. And at the same time, I didn't want to load out all my feelings at the top of the episode and then be like, okay, let's just switch gears right now and, and share so-and-so's story. Because whatever I say in the intro, if it's heavier, will carry weight into the interview that follows it. I may have made this mistake in the past. I I don't know. I'm not recalling off the top of my head. Um, But today I feel like I can't. I can't not talk about what's happening in the world uh, right now. I'm heart sick and I'm really struggling to perform like just small day to day tasks because of what's happening. And at the same time, I, um, I, I don't want to not be there for the audience, even though I feel the way that I feel. And I will be honest, I want to stop. Not forever, but for right now, I want to stop everything. I don't want to. <sighs> I want to go into stasis and wake up in a future that doesn't have any of the problems that we're experiencing right now. And I feel weak for having that desire. Um, But at the same time, I also think it's very fair for any of us to feel this way. Uh, I am, I really feel internally like I'm being torn apart in, in my, my belief of, what humanity is supposed to be. Honestly, I'm really, really struggling this week. But I can't fight my natural inclination to like be there for my, my people, for my tribe, right? I, that is a big part of who I am. And so what I've decided, at least for today and I don't know how long it'll last, but I I need to get feelings out. I need to talk about what's happening right now, in particular in the United States. Although, like I said at the top of the show, there's a version of this is happening all over the world at all times. Um, and I don't want to detract away from the stories that have been so graciously shared with me. And I want to devote their episodes to them and I want to honor them within their episodes. So, uh, I'm going to push those back for now. Maybe by next week I'll feel a little bit better and we'll get back on track. Maybe not. I, I don't really honestly know at this point. I just know that I feel like I'm in full turtle mode and I'm trying to resist it, but I want to go dark. I'm trying not to. So I'm going to talk about what's happening right now and we'll, I'll, I'll inform, I guess, through the social media platforms, um, you know, where I'm at as the weeks progress, but, uh, yeah, 
I don't know. I, I just I, I couldn't put out a regular episode this week and not be able to devote my full um, attention and heart to those episodes because every episode is very important to me. And, uh, you know, I don't take it lightly. I don't take your sharing of your mixed race experience with me lightly at all. Um, and I don't often feel worthy of of the edit or of the share, you know, because I I'm not going to be perfect at this, but I still want to get it out. Um, and, and I just like today, my heart is not there. <laughs> so, okay. I'm sure you all know, especially if you listen to this show in particular, what's happening particularly here in the United States. Um, what I want to say is that what is happening right now in is not new. None of us that are here and most likely none of us that are all over the world should be surprised that any of what is happening is happening right now. But at the same time, I wanted to be clear what is actually happening because even within my own social circle, I'm seeing people not really cl clearly seeing the picture. And I'm not saying that I'm the only one that has the clear picture. I don't, I'm sure there's a lot that's complicated going on that I don't understand. But what I do have is experience. I am a product of a predominantly black hood environment where I grew up. I also grew up during the LA riots in which when I was 12 and a half ish, 13, um, I lived through that experience. And what I did not realize until this week is that I do suffer a form of PTSD from that experience. I, I have always chopped up, chalked up my experiences growing up in Long Beach is just like, yeah, I'm sure I have PTSD from a lot of the things that, that happened during that time, but um, that's just a part of black life. You know, like for years, I just walked around with this idea of like, that's just a part of black life. And um, regardless of fairness or, or what should and should not be, I just swallowed it and internalized it as many, many people do. And when other uh, rebellions have happened and I'm not calling them riots. Um, when other rebellions have happened, I am triggered and I am hurt by them. But for some reason, in particular, this one is hitting way more close to home than they have in recent years. Uh, so I kind of want to talk about that a little bit. Um, being a 12 year old and seeing in a time before social media, before the internet, seeing that grainy videotape of Rodney King being beat within an inch of his life from multiple police being multiply ta being tased multiple times, being beat with billy clubs and things like that, knowing what I was watching, albeit grainy and distant, um, has never left me. Never left me. The lack of humanity that you must have to be able to take a billy club to a human's body and repeatedly hit them. Because once you hit somebody more than once with that, you gotta be thinking that death is a possibility. Like how many hits is enough for you to stop, right? And how much damage to the body is enough for you to just feel justified in what you did? Do you hit somebody once to defuse a situation, knock them out, hopefully, and get them out of the situation that they're in? Or do you beat somebody within an inch of their life? This is something that I always struggled with after watching that video. And again, I grew up in Long Beach during the time when uh, both the Long Beach PD and the LEPD and the Compton PD were notorious for um, the brutalization of black and brown bodies. <laughs> they still are. Um, I've told the story on the show many times about being picked up while hanging out in the park when I was a kid, in the park as a kid with um, my friends that were darker skinned than me and they all got dropped off in the Mexican neighborhoods and I got dropped off at home because they couldn't tell what race I was. 
and I don't want to blow past the the thing about the kids being dropped off in the Mexican neighborhoods. Um, it, I'm sure it's not much different now, to be honest. But when I was growing up, they were pitting the, the black and brown communities against each other on a regular basis. And this is before cell phones and this is before um, social media. Right. So the black kids who the cops didn't want to take to juvie or whatever things they would torment and they would take them to the Mexican neighborhoods and drop them off or they would ride them around for hours and then drop them off in an unknown neighborhood, not necessarily the closest Mexican neighborhood to our black neighborhood. And they would drop them off in an alley and they would say, good luck. And those kids would have to try to find their way home with no money, with no phones, with no ability besides the kindness of strangers, hopefully, to help them get home. And inevitably, they would get assaulted by the kids that were local to that community. And again, I don't necessarily know that it has to do with actual um, prejudice against black and brown people themselves. But what were they were being policed to do? They were being made to do. They were pitted against each other and therefore they had to survive. And to do that, they might have to fight the Mexican kids and the neighborhoods that they're being dropped off in. And some of them would get beat up really bad. Some of them would die and some of them would survive and it would start a war between the two communities. And this was a common occurrence when I was growing up. And I imagine it still is. Except for it might be videotaped now. So several times we had gotten picked up doing very benign things, hanging in a park, hanging out still at school, walking home from school. And we get picked up and I got taken home and they got dropped off in that neighborhood. I was told to not hang out with that element, to be a good girl. And then my black dad would open the door and their faces would change and I knew it was racism. I knew it was white supremacy that was making that thing happen. And it's not like I appear to be white. It's not like they were mistaking me for white. I don't know what they were thinking I was, but they weren't thinking I was Mexican and they weren't thinking I was black. And so when they saw my black dad, I think they regretted their decision not to clump me with the rest of my friends. We would be harassed by white police officers walking home from school, and I lived maybe four blocks from my school. I went to Jordan High School in Long Beach, which was right next to a, a park, which is the park that I got picked up in. And then I had maybe another two to three block walk to get home. It would take us 20 minutes, but we would inevitably get harassed by the cops on the way home a lot of times. So when the riots happen, the same thing that is happening in Minnesota and, and Louisville right now is was happening there. It's It starts out by a lot of angry people trying to find a place to gather, and mostly in family clumps and, and in, in church groups and things like that. And, and there's, there's yelling and screaming, and what are we going to do? There's some people urging us to fight back, and some people telling us to you know, turn the other cheek, and it's a mixed bag of things that are happening. Um, I can tell you in my neighborhood, there was not that to my knowledge, my 12 year old knowledge, there was not like an organized protest. But what did happen is that white people in plain clothes started busting up places. And that's all you have to do. It's almost like the cartoons where they draw the line of gunpowder from one place to another and light that thing. And you have to watch the spark slowly go uh, eat up the gunpowder until it hits the powder cakes and explode. They start harassing people and busting up buildings and, and things like that. And then the neighborhood follows. Um, and then we already have all this like pitted against each other stuff that has happened in advance of this. So it's easy to go on to the attack of the people that you've been pitted against. In my neighborhood, it was a combination of the Koreans that ran the liquor stores or the Indians, the East Asians or the Mexican kids. And so, and I lived in crypt territory. And so there was the, the gang violence coupled with the anti-blackness from the people that owned businesses in our neighborhoods. And that was all we needed. That was all that happened. And so 
my neighborhood, despite its removal from South Central, participated in the riots. My dad, among with a, a handful of other um, fathers in the neighborhood, stood watch outside of the grocery store. We had one grocery store in our neighborhood for miles. And it was at the edge of our block and they stood watch that night to protect the grocery store and prevent anybody from looting it so that we would, our community would have food that throughout however long this was going to last. My dad was not a good man. Um, I, I didn't have a good relationship with him, but this is one of the things that I admired about him, that he stood watch that night and protected the grocery store along with the other fathers from the neighborhood um, so that we would at least have that institution available to us after all this was done. I remember the signs of, of black owned business. Please don't loot spray painted or, or hung to black owned businesses. Um, I remember the Koreans with shotguns standing outside of their business. I, I remember the loss of life. I remember the violence. I remember running to my home after school um, to try to feel safe. And that was 30 years ago. So when I see what's happening right now, I and it's not like there haven't been other rebellions. It's just that for some reason in particular, this one hits so close to home. It feels so much like what I remember um, that my body is triggered my my I've, I feel the weight I feel a physical weight on me I'm really struggling to get through very small day-to-day -day tasks I, I I'm really really struggling this week um, so I want to put I, I explain my experience to to explain why I feel the way that I feel about this I am not in any way shape or form upset about the rebellion happening I am not in any way, shape, or form upset about necessarily about some of the buildings and the property destruction. The reason why is because it's rebellions like that that affect change and not just black and brown change. The reason why the United States of America was even created was because white people that were even persecuted for their religion left England and came here and took land from brown people and then started rebellious acts and civil unrest just like what is happening right now and then fought a war to get their freedom and that is exactly what is happening right now make no fucking mistake that is exactly what's happening right now black and brown people want the freedom to live without fear that doing just that living will be the reason why they are murdered whether you are a birder walking through Central Park admiring wildlife and asking a fellow citizen to leash their dogs so that you don't risk the harming the wildlife and having the cops called on them and being lied and the cops being lied to about whether or not that black man is threatening this white woman's life. That's just living while black and being threatened for that. Or your Breonna Taylor asleep in your bed, not even knowing that plainclothes people burst into your house without um, you knowing, without even announcing that they're police, no knock warrant, and coming in and killing you. And then arresting your boyfriend for trying to defend his home because he has no reason to know that there are police that have just burst into his home. They didn't commit crimes and they were asleep. And then he's arrested for attempting a murder of a police officer. That's sleeping while black and not waking up. Whether you're driving down the road and you think you're being followed and harassed and you're afraid and you pull over and you're begging on Facebook Live for someone to come save you and then you run for your life and you're shot and worse than that, you're live streaming your death and you're hearing and the rest of the world is hearing the cops stand above your body and talk shit about you why you're dead and i'm not going to repeat what he said i think if you've seen the videos or heard it you you know what was said and i can't even begin to remember all the names of the people i can talk about the most recent names clearer than i can with the the whole list or the ones that had the bigger social impact we can talk about george floyd this week we can talk about breonna taylor we can talk about sean reed 
we can dig in the crates a little bit and talk about Philando Castillo and Sandra Bland and Eric Garner and Trayvon Martin. But there are hundreds of names. There's there's a few people this week that have died who I cannot for the life of me right now while I'm recording remember. The black trans man in Florida that was killed by the police. The black trans woman in, uh, I don't remember if it was Mississippi or Alabama or something that was killed last week. It's happening so frequently, I can't even remember the names. And I feel guilt about that. And I'm angry that I can't even honor the people that have been murdered because I can't remember their names because there's too many of them. That was ridiculous. And I'm angry. And I want people to be careful when they're regramming and retweeting and reposting about the, these murder videos because as black people and as mixed black people, we're used to seeing black bodies and trauma. But it doesn't mean that it's easy on you to see it. And I understand if you're a person who feels like you're honoring the person and watching the video. And I also understand if you're a person who feels like you just can't watch the video because you can't watch another black body and trauma. I don't think it matters where on the spectrum you fall. I think you do need to listen to yourself for that. Whatever is, it, it could be more healthy for you to watch it and it could be less healthy for you to watch it. It, it depends on you. <laughs> But, but be careful in how you share it and, and, and the context in which you share it. Sharing without explanation gives people license to view it in, under their lens. But crafting a thoughtful message about it, you know, might make it easier for a person to decide if they're going to see it. And certainly things that auto autoplay when you click on it can be very traumatizing for people. So really be thoughtful about what it is you're sharing when you're sharing it. Uh, not everybody needs the visual because we've lived the visual. So I'm, I guess I'm saying this more towards people that aren't black or mixed black in the sharing of it. Because you may be viewing it at, in with the human lens of a human body is, is in trauma right now and we need to stop this thing. But those of us that are black or mixed black are seeing it in an experience level because we probably have seen it in real life. And it, it triggers a fight, fight, or freeze response in our body to see those types of things. Um, I can no longer watch the videos. Uh, the last video I watched in its entirety was uh, Philando Castillo and uh, the parts of the Freddie Gray video that you could see. I wake up sometimes hearing Freddie Gray scream, though. Um, and so I can't often put myself in the position of watching the videos anymore. Because I also saw that in real life, you know, growing up. I've had my hands in the chest of a friend that had been shot. Thinking I was applying pressure or helping. I was a 12-year-old. I didn't know if I was helping. And they died and... I have that memory, so I, I I don't need to, I can't watch the videos anymore. So I'm just asking for like thoughtfulness in how you share, because without context, you might be triggering someone's um, fight, flight, or fear, uh, freeze uh, responses. Uh, I also think it's really important to take care of your mental health in times like this. I'm not saying ignore what's happening, but I'm saying shut down if you need to shut down. Um, because we still need you. We need the village. Never more now, never more than now, do I understand what I mean when I say we need the village. They can take us out as individuals, but we, we have to unite as a village to protect the rest of us. Um, I say all that, but I, I also want to say that activism shows itself in different ways and different people. 
And I think there's value in, in shaping your activism with your own skill set. I've said before, and I do still feel this way, uh, I'm not the most effective if I'm marching. Uh, I am not in the best physical condition. And if things go a different way, I might not only endanger my own safety because of my my physical issues, but um, I could be putting someone else in harm's way because they're trying to protect me. I think about that when I go out with my husband because he is very alert and he's always looking to make sure that he can protect me. And I don't mean to make light of this, but in the same way that a lot of us get frustrated watching the movie Titanic when Kate Winslet jumps back onto the boat, which essentially is the reason why Leo ends up dying in the end. If she had just stayed in the boat, he could have gotten his own way out. The, that, that belief. Um, I don't want to be the reason why my partner or somebody who sees me in need um, ends up being harmed or, or killed because they're trying to protect me. Um, it's a real fear of mine because I've, I've had to be protected before. Um, so marching is not where I feel like I can lend my my biggest support. But what I do have is platforms. I have militantly mixed and I have blurred comics and I can use my voice. And uh, no matter how small my, my platforms are, they're still out there and they're still affecting people that listen. Um, I know that because of the emails that I get and the, the messages that I get on social media from y'all. I know that this podcast affects change in people. And so I can use this as a form of activism to share um I guess my beliefs about the village, about protecting the village over the individual. I do think that if you're capable of putting your body in front of somebody else that could be harmed, that that is an important thing to do if you can, if you're a person who, who can. I also think it's important to be a strategic person if that's where your skill set is and finding a way to, to, to use strategy to help others. Um, if you have a, a tactile skill, like a crafting of some sort, like if you're making masks for people with, to fight against the COVID um, spread or, or you can make clothes or sleeping bags or quilts or blankets for, for the homeless, um, if you can use a physical skill like that, um, that can be a form of activism because you could be providing something to somebody who is in need. If you have event organizing skills and you can create a food bank or uh, a shower day for homeless or um, a coat drive or toy drive even for people in need, that is a form of activism. So I guess I'm, I'm charging you that if you listen, that you find what your form of activism is and you apply it because we desperately need everybody all hands right now all the time but right now because this rebellion is spreading to different cities and I think that we're seeing something that's probably equatable to what was going on in the civil rights era um, oh we're at that place that we can't be silenced. We thought we were at it before, but we clearly weren't because Colin Kaepernick and Eric Reed lost their positions because they were kneeling in silent protest, in nonviolent silent protest against police brutality. Eric managed to continue on in the NFL, but Colin didn't. And they say that's not the right way to protest. So then we march. The Women's March various marches for, for people that have been murdered by the police. And they tell us that's not the right way. And they mace us and they arrest us and they drive cars into us. <laughs> and they say that that's not the right way. So then we do a combination of peaceful protests and fighting back, physical fighting back. And they tell us that's not right. And they call the national guard on us. And they go into place plain clothes and they bust up buildings and they light fires and they say it's us. And still we haven't found the right way to protest. And yet our constitution 
here in the United States makes room for us to protest this way. All citizens to protest this way. It makes room for civil unrest or civil disobedience, whatever you want to call it. It makes room for revolution because that's how America was created. So if we're applying all the tactics that are gifted to us by the Constitution, but we're not protesting correctly, we're not doing it right, where does that leave us? That leaves us with nothing. So we burn it to the ground and start over. It's happened before. So either they work with us and make room for our humanity or just like they did when they left England, they burn it to the ground and start over. And we might be there right now. History is telling me that what's actually going to happen is we're going to sweep up the glass and we're going to board up the buildings and it's going to go back to status quo. LA riots made us think that it was revolution and then it faded. And Ferguson made us think it was revolution and then it faded. But this one is happening in multiple cities at multiple times. It's days and days in and it's still happening. And that sounds like revolution to me. That sounds like rebellion. The that's not looting, that's not rioting, that's not vandalism for vandalism's sake. That is happening. I'm not saying it's not happening. But that always happens. Everything, it's, everything's multi-layered. It's not one thing happening. You're not just seeing looting. You're not just seeing vandalism. You're seeing silent protesters, peaceful protesters alongside violent protesters. You're seeing people fighting back in different types of ways. And you're seeing them burn precincts to the ground. Because if, if we can't be heard while we're silently kneeling, we can't be heard when we're screaming at a podium, we can't be heard when there's hundreds of thousands of us on the street, then all you're telling us is that we don't deserve to be heard. And that's not true. And we're not going to take it. And I think that's what we're seeing right now. I don't have a call to action that is telling you to do anything outside of your comfort. I'm not telling you to go violent if you're nonviolent. I'm not telling you to go nonviolent if you're violent. I'm not telling you to, to march if you're not a marcher. What I'm telling you is find the skill set that you have and apply your activism there. Whether it is writing letters to government officials and making phone calls or plugging up city hall by standing in front of it or exercising your second amendment right when while brown or ex exercising your first amendment right all the time or sewing blankets or collecting cans or providing a shower to a homeless person for the night, whatever the thing is that you are capable of doing, giving money even, find the place that your actual skills, your, your individual skills can be applied to benefit the village. Because we're going to need to rebuild after this is done. And we're going to need all hands on deck and we're going to need all skill sets. I, I do want to end on saying that, um, I'm happy to, to be a funnel point for people that are either have skills or resources that they can share with others, or there are people in need and need connection to those resources. So if you, um, have an organization that supports 
predominantly black and brown underserved communities that needs help, I'd like you to reach out to me and let me know what you need so that I can promote it on the show and, and hopefully get folks involved. Or if you um, are in need and you don't know where to turn, you can reach out to me and I will try to connect you with the resources you have. I know I don't have the financial resources, but what I do have is the platform of Militantly Mixed and Blurred Comics. And I have a few skills that I apply in my day-to-day life for my own activism. And whatever I can do, I will do. And whatever I can't do, I will try to find people who can. And that is the best that I can offer. And I think that if there's something like that that you have that is the best that you can offer, um, it's important that you do. Uh, If you refer to the show notes at the end of the show, um, I'm going to list a few organizations that I have vetted um, that would be, that could use financial donations if you have them, if you have that ability, Um, or they can use resources like masks, um, hand sewn masks or medical supplies or canned goods or things like that. Um, I'm going to list those in the show notes. Again, if you have an organization that you vetted, please let me know and I'll, I'll re- vet it myself and add it to the list. And what, I, what I'm saying in vetting is don't just give money to the Red Cross or the Salvation Army um, and think that you're, you're helping. Pay attention to the organization's um, operation costs. Their operation costs are more than 15 to 20 percent that they are not a charitable organization. If their CEO makes over $200,000 a year, then they're not a charitable organization. I know everybody needs to eat, but you don't need $640,000 to run the Salvation Army every year. Um, Some organizations that are under the guise of charity actually are very terroristic in their, in their tactics towards how they apply that money, um, like the Salvation Army. Um, So be careful in what you're donating to and seek things that are closer to home, grassroots, your community, your direct community, your people, your tribe, because you'll have more of an impact that way. And so if there is an organization that you're paired with that I would like to, you would like me to participate in, um, please give me the details so that I can do that research. Um, and then I will talk about it on the show. I'm going to do my best not to go fully dark, although I do feel that coming on. I, I, I do feel like I, I'm in turtle mode or I wish to be in turtle mode. I'm, I am fighting it. Um, but I may, for my own health, need to give into it for a little bit. And if I do, I will try to communicate that beforehand. Um, but even if I am in turtle mode, I'm, I'm never not available to help. I will always try to help. Um, So if you are in need, please reach out and we'll try to pair you up with uh, resources to help you out. Um, Other than that, please stay safe. Wash your hands. Don't touch your face. Don't forget that despite what's happening in terms of the rebellions, that we are still in a global pandemic and COVID is going to be a part of this story um, for the rebellions. And we need to protect ourselves, both our physical health and our our social health, our mental health as well. Yeah. I think that's all I got for y'all today. Stay safe out there, y'all. Militantly Mix is a main hustle media podcast produced and hosted by me, Charmaine Fury. Music is by David Bogan, the one. You can follow us on social media on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Militantly Mixed. If you'd like to become a sponsor of Militantly Mixed, please go to patreon.com slash militantly mixed for monthly sponsorship or paypal.me slash militantly mixed for a one-time only donation. And if you like what you hear on Militantly Mixed, please subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And don't forget to be your mixed ass self. Main Hustle Media. Turn your side hustle into your main hustle.